alphabet of the gods. And I am, as you know, absolutely fascinated with the mysteries of the past. I know you are too. And because, for a simple reason, unless we understand what our past really was, we can never find out and understand who we really are. And we all know that. We all know that the advance of the human spirit into higher consciousness depends upon an, a clear understanding of the human past. So I think that Ross has done something rather amazing with this book, The Mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. And let me quote an extraordinary book. Ross Hamilton's discoveries and revelations in Mystery of the Serpent Mound kick open the door to an amazing Reevaluation of what we call the new world. Jeff Rentz said that, and I would heartily concur. This is one book that I read with such fascination that I almost had finished it by the time I sat down to read it. So welcome to the show, Ross. Uh, I'm delighted to have you. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. No, oh, great, Willie. It's great to be on your show. Well, good. Uh, first, let's begin by getting an explanation. What is the Great Serpent Mountain? Where is it? Well, <clears throat> Great Serpent Mound is an earthwork which, if it were not in the form of a serpent but just stretched out, would be a quarter of a mile long. Mm -hmm. It's located in southern Ohio, actually pretty close to the Ohio River, not far at all. I would say within about six miles as the crow flies. It was constructed on a very high piece of land that's on the edge of what we call a crypto explosion feature, which is a piece of property, mostly stone, with earth that's gathered on top of it over the millennia. That's about five kilometers across, and we're pretty sure now that it was created by an immense impact from an asteroid that broke up uh, millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. This piece of property is uh, understandably unique because the rock is shattered more than, I think, two kilometers below the surface, and it creates a, um, a constant trapping and changing of the magnetic field so that there's a lot of magnetic and gravitational anomalies throughout the crypto explosion feature. But these anomalies are, are, are really evident at the serpent mound. Now, it, it, why would it be that in the distant past, how, how can you detect these anomalies now? Well, a sensitive person can detect them if, one, if he or she spends enough time there. I, how? I talked to the, how well, for example, I talked to the previous park manager. He's an older man, and uh, he was uh, uh, pretty much a professional policeman most of his life. But uh, he... He was uh, able to see earth lights. He was able to detect uh, specific energy fields, especially along the side of the cliffs that the Serpent Mound rests near. And other people that I've talked to have seen unusual creatures. Uh, I, I think a, a, almost a hot pink frog was, was seen there at one time. And plants that don't seem to grow anywhere else in the state seem to grow around that area. And there's a lot of unusual caves and other enigmatic subterranean structures going on. There's an unusual bat population. Um, by the way, Earthlight, an Earthlight uh, is discussed by Paul Devereaux in some of his books. Yes. Um, Earthlights are a, a strange phenomenon that we believe now are associated with with a concentration of magnetic force that rises up and becomes almost electrical, and then it interacts sometimes with the gases of the atmosphere to produce strange effects, which include the ability to to shape its mass to form what a person wants to see. So if a person believes in ghosts, sometimes the earth lights will, will take the form, these wisps will take the form of ghostly apparitions. So they, they seem to be manipulable through uh, the imagination or the, or the will of someone who is really believes. So it, this whole feature uh, that the Serpent Mound uh, rests on 
is very is relatively high, and the energies from the crypto explosion feature seem to gradually find their way through the dolomite, which is mostly limestone that uh, is beneath the, uh, the earthwork, and 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 converge into the earthwork structure itself, which which was made to be a little bit on the top, or mostly on the top of that whole area. So. So as the energies rise up, they they seem to find some sort of consummation and animation with the serpent. And if you go there really early in the morning or in the winter when nobody's been walking around sort of soaking up the energy, you can feel it. it the, the area is very charged. It's uh, I won't say it's electrical, but it can be that. Um, I remember uh, two people telling me that they witnessed lightning strikes right near that area. And, of course, Native American legend speaks about these types of effigies being made, this being the, the great one, that were specifically created to attract lightning because they were able to gather together the earth spirit, which is kind of like a very positive force. And when you get enough of that energy collected, uh, it, it will attract lightning. So they believe that the Thunderbird came and opened his eyes and lightning flashed out, and he was always in the hunt for the serpent. So <laughs> you can see where this mythology may have evolved from. Yeah, well, in part, but as we get into this, it's going to become clear that there's much more here than meets the eye. I, 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 let me put it this way, folks. We are going on a journey like you have never gone on before. You may think that the Great Serpent Mound has is isolated, an isolated North American phenomenon, but we are looking at a statement in the form of a serpent-shaped mound that is of world historical importance and contains what I think must be one of the most compressed and incredibly dense uh, uh, concentrations of knowledge on this planet. This is a mystery. I didn't know it was a mystery until I picked up Ross's book, but it's a mystery and it's exciting. So we're just at the beginning of the mystery. And now let's go into another area here. Uh, and I have to ask you just in passing, are you familiar with Mound Road? Mound Road. Mound Road. It's out there near, it's not far from the Great Serpent Mound. Uh, well, there are a lot of mounds around. There, there are. <laughs> I've never heard uh, of the term Mound Road. Road, so you got me on that one. Well, because uh, out on Mound Road, there was a um, an EG and G Rotron facility for a while, and it was an underground facility. And you mentioned strange caves before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I, that Rotron facility may still be there, and I'm not sure. I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm, absolutely, I'm actually not sure how close it is to the Serpent Mound. It could be quite a distance away. But in any case, there was an interest in these, in the makers of underground facilities. They have a big underground facility in Woodstock, New York, that connects to the, uh, to the, uh, Iron Mountain facility that's south of Woodstock and Rosendale. So Rotron is in this underground facility game. And they're also out there in the mound area. And I was just interested to, if you could tell us a little bit more about the caves. Well, the caves in the area, nobody really knows. But when we went up for the, uh, I guess it was in November, for the Harmonic Concordance, uh, we all gathered at the mound, and there was, there was quite a few people there. And one of the women who lives on the property adjacent to the mound, Delcy, she mentioned that uh, just a week before, when she was out um, on the road, her house is a very rural area, uh, it, was, it, it was just beginning to rain a little bit, and it was, a, it was a, thunder, a thunderstorm. And the lightning came, and it went into the ground, and there was no thunder sound for a couple of seconds, and it, and it hit so close, all of a sudden she hears the thunder under her feet. Now, this woman is not given over to telling tales, and, and her mother experienced the same thing. The, the thunder came from underground, but, but the lightning came from the sky. So this got back to the harmonic convergence, which was back in the late 80s. There's another huge gathering of people there. 
And at that time, we had a, a group of people who, some of them were very sensitive, some of them were known psychics, some of them were dowsers, and they all agreed that there was some sort of a vast and awesome cavern system in that specific area because of all the limestone. Now, we, we found a, a number of small caves, and there's a huge collapsed sinkhole right on the Serpent Mountain property, but it appears as though there is a very... Um, I mean, a very important cave system under there that no one has been able to figure out how to get into it yet. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd never heard of anything like that, but, you know. No. <laughs> well, this is on that note. Uh, we're going to take a little break. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Whitley Strieber, it's Dreamland. We are back with Ross Hamilton, the mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. Ross's website, greatserpentmound.org. That's greatserpentmound.org. And I think you will find uh, that is a most interesting place to go to continue to explore the Great Serpent Mound. Now, you talk a lot about the Gosh, I mean, there's so many different ways to get directions to go to get into this. Let's talk first now. We've established who made it and where it is and some of the strangeness of the area that it's in. Now let's talk about the when. And that's in and of itself a very interesting story. So why don't you give us a little bit of the history of, of the Great Serpent Mountain and who made it when we think it was made. All right. First, you have a little background. The archaeological community is very conservative in Ohio. Um, when the first settlers came over the Alleghenies, uh, this is in the early 1800s, <clears throat> mainly through the 1840s, they drove the native people out, and they discovered well over 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. Now, eventually... There was over 100,000 mounds when they got to the Mississippi, including the Great South. But in Ohio, there were 10,000. And there were so many mounds that these people, when they received their parcels of land, just couldn't resist digging them up, you know. Now, this is several thousand years have passed, and the Indians never dug up their ancestors, and they, and they didn't even dig up their, their enemies. Uh, we came, and uh, just within a you know a short span of less than a century, we literally destroyed all of them. And they found uh, that there were three types of mounds. There was a kind of enclosure mound that seemed to have a, a the, the meaning of fortification, like there were many trees had been planted, uh, creating a sort of fortress around the, these rings. Then there were um, the effigy mounds and, and the geometric mounds. And these include, uh, are still today, uh, the Newark earthworks and the serpent mound. And then there were the, the burial mounds. Now, the burial mounds, for, for the most part, um, were fairly relatively recent. The serpent mound seems to be the oldest, along with Newark, from our researches. Now, like I said, the archaeological community is relatively conservative, and they have always done their dating by a method that people wouldn't really argue about. So they could pretty much get their, um, get their papers written. Now, when the first true archaeologist came there, Professor Putnam from Harvard, he was the one that, that got the area preserved for about $5,000. He was able to buy it from a corn farmer who was going to destroy this great serpent just so he could plant a few more years of corn. Now, he noted that at the time they had no way of telling how old this thing was, except that there was a foot of topsoil on top of this clay effigy. Well, not long after I started doing this research, I got in touch with a, a modern archaeologist, and he noted that um, through carbon dating on a site similar or close to Serpent Mountain, they were able to determine that about four inches, I think he said, of topsoil was it four inches or four? 
force. I, I've forgotten exactly the, the precise amount, but um, a certain amount of topsoil accumulates under certain conditions. It was the point he was trying to make. And those conditions have to be that there can't be any sloping ground. It has to be a highland preserve, and it has to be kind of held in with woods. Under those conditions, you can acquire or accumulate a specific amount of topsoil through the rotting of, of uh, leaves and so forth. Now, this this uh, amount of topsoil a foot corresponded to about 5,000 years. Now, the archaeological community says that the mound is 900 years old. And the reason mm-hmm. they say that, and there's a lot of contradiction there, the reason they say that is because they dug into the mound about uh, about 10 years ago. Well, actually, it's been longer than that now. It's been about 14 years. They dug into it, and they found some pieces of carbon. They found three pieces of carbon. Now, Indians will tell you that groundhogs go into the mound, and they take with them whatever they have. And what's on top of the mound can get put underneath. They found carbon that dated back about 2,000 years ago. And then they found some carbon that dated to about 900 years ago. So they they found two pieces that dated to about 900 years ago, but there were no artifacts with it. In other words, you have to associate carbon with an artifact in order to really get you know a clear idea of how old something is. You can say, well... A person was here, here's an arrowhead, and here's a piece of carbon, so we, we can we can assume that this guy who made this arrowhead was here at this particular time, according right. to the carbon date. Well, there were no artifacts found in the mound. All they found was carbon, and it could have been from campfires that had been made by someone who had lived there 900 years ago, because the place was constantly being lived in for the last 5,000 years by various tribes from the Archaic period all the way through the three divisions of the Woodland period. And uh, they threw out the piece of carbon that, that dated it back to the Archaic period. <laughs> Why did it, they do that? Just because oh, they just didn't feel it, sh- was, right. it couldn't be right. Right. They, they felt it words, could the, be right. The, the evidence that didn't fit the theory got thrown out. Right. Exactly. Well, that, that's the opposite of the scientific method. But that's, that's what I try to emphasize in my book. Now, yeah. Professor Putnam was ignored. His right, he was the first guy there. These people basically took the information that he provided that, that they could use, and they threw out what they didn't like. And this is, I'm going to say it out loud, it's the Ohio Historical Society and their, their archaeological branch. Now, they went and had a big bronze plaque made and planted it in the ground saying, we now know, at least we now believe, that the serpent is only 900 years old. But I have three pieces of evidence that proves contrary to that, and they didn't even consider that before they cast this this bronze plaque. And that the soil evidence is one. Putnam said there was a foot of soil on the serpent, and I believe there was a foot of soil over the whole area. And they had to have cleared it because the, the base of the serpent is on rock. So they cleared the whole area when they made it, just like they cleared the the plain of Giza to make the Great Pyramid. Right. And they constructed this thing precisely the way they wanted it to be. Now, I have a friend who's an archaeologist, and he's actually an archaeoastronomer, and he went in there, and he discovered that the seven loops of the serpent, at least five of them, correspond to specific lunar events that typify the 18.6-year lunar cycle. Hmm. Now, he mapped that out, and that's in the book for anybody who wants to look at right. it. Right. And at the same time, the people that did the carbon work at Serpent Mount also decided that maybe there, there's something to the astronomy. So they investigated the possibility of, of solar events, excuse me. And they found uh, that there are these three coils that go outward uh, correspond to the summer solstice, rising sun. The equinox is in the center coil. And then at the base near the coil, that last coil that loops out, the big one, if you stood inside that and looked to the east, you'd see the winter solstice sunrise. And these lines are perfect. So when you combine that lunar and solar together, you you have the most remarkable, I I guess you would say, example of an ancient genius that anyone would... But these two people didn't agree. My, My friend, who found the lunar alignments, published it, in a reputable archaeological paper. And then these people published theirs, you know, the, the Ohio Historical Society people. And the, the two of them just didn't get along. And so that nobody ever, so what I did in my book was I brought them together. And then 
just as luck would have it, I had a template of the serpent, and I happened to throw it on top of a star book, and I started to see that there was a correlation between the, the constellation Draco and the Great Serpent Mound. And after you know several weeks of investigating and consulting with astronomers and buying star maps, I found that, indeed, <laughs> there were over 36 points of light that precisely fell on the edges of the serpent with the major parts of the constellation Drago featured on the coils. So we had three archaeoastronomy events occurring. And also a very unusual artifact for any kind of archaeoastronomy. And we're going to take a little break now. And believe me, hold on to your hats, folks, because you're going to go down some very unexpected paths in a minute. So, Switley Strieber, it's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. We're talking to Ross Hamilton about the mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. And if you think this thing has been explained, think again. There is something going on out in central Ohio that is not explained at all and that could contain one of the most important keys there is to the answer to the question of who we really are. Now, just before we left the air, we were talking about, you, you mentioned that, that it had lunar significance, solar significance, and stellar significance, which makes it, again, an incredibly compact and concentrated source of knowledge. Uh -huh. Because there's lots of monuments that are lunar, lots that are solar, a few that are stellar, but not too many that I know of that are all three out there. And that that uh, is remarkable. Now, tell us about the relationship with Draco. Okay, this is probably one of the most remarkable discoveries that I that I have ever stumbled over. And, and believe me, when you make really good discoveries, you usually come across them innocently <laughs> without really trying. In my case, I found that there was one star that did not fit into the template. It was. It was just brazenly sitting out beneath the first coil from the head, the seventh coil from the tail. And then I remembered my friend, the archaeoastronomer, telling me that Indian legend, Cherokee legend, said that in order to discover the heart of the serpent, you must look beneath the seventh coil. And, of course, the other Indian legends, all even way out west, they all say the same thing. If you want to slay the serpent, you must discover his heart beneath the seventh coil. This is a, you know, kind of a ubiquitous Indian legend. And so on a hunch, after I set all the other stars, I noticed that this one kind of, I guess you would say, indifferent or renegade star was right beneath the first coil from the head or the seventh from the tail. So I took my compass, a good German steel compass, and put the sharp point on that star and extended it out to the tip of the serpent's snout, their little triangular feature and drew a circle, and I was astonished to find that it touched perfectly to the base of the tail as I drew the circle. And what's more is that the distance across that circle was precisely 680 feet, which corresponded to many Egyptian measures and many of the measurements found in the Celtic stone works. Now, in what, can you be more specific about that? Yeah, it's uh, the megalithic. Um, the megalithic yard is derived um, from that measure. Uh, the works of Alexander Tom and the works of John Michel uh, pretty much uh, emphasize this particular measure. Um, now, con conventional wisdom is that there was no connection whatsoever with what was happening in Mesoamerica, in Indian America, and what was happening in, uh, say, the Mediterranean Basin or in Mesopotamia. No connection. And yet, it sounds like uh, you would have to disagree with that. Well, I, I agree with it to a certain point, but because of the antiquity of the Serpent Mount, I disagree with it. Because 
5,000 years ago, we now know the Great Pyramid was constructed, the, great, the largest pyramid. Again. Right. We also know that Stonehenge began its construction 5,000 years ago, and this is pretty much agreed upon by archaeologists in Great Britain. When I found out that this pole star, that this, excuse me, I just blew it, the, the star beneath the seventh coil was the pole star 5,000 years ago. Oh, my. Yeah. So then, I, then it all came together, and that's why you see the picture in the front of my book with Stonehenge and the, and the pyramids and the Great Serpent. Because Th- they were- that is powerful. I, it, it, so it may be that, well, of course, they must have, it must be. Why else might they have chosen that star? Say it is a later date. Would there have been any reason to choose that star at all? <laughs> the only reason that one would choose that star would be to make your effigy central to the top of the night sky. Right. And using that as the center of my compass and drawing that circle out, I was able to view, and you can see it on our website, at least I believe she has that on there, Pat, Pat Mason, my, my web partner. You can see the great serpent would have circled around that particular pole star because, as as you know, our present pole star is called the pole star because it's the only star in the night sky, even in the day, that doesn't appear to move. Right. You know, all the other stars will, will, will whip around. And, and, and uh, if you had a, a time-lapse photography, you'd, you'd see them like so many headlights that have been smeared across the night sky. But that one star remains bright and shining right at the top because it sits over our pole. And so it creates sort of an optical illusion that it doesn't move while the rest of the stars move. It's really right. a planet moving. But because that was the pole star 5,000 years ago, um, now, of course, it's Polaris. But, but because of this effect of what we call precession, there's this very almost imperceptible movement, a kind of secondary uh, rotation of the Earth's um, axis that takes you around in a, in a small circle uh, once every 24, 25,000 years, the area time of precession. And that's how we actually have the precession of the equinoxes. Right. The astronomy and the astrology all converge. So the, the pole star would have been in uh, in Draconis, in uh, it, 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 it then. Therefore, the, it would have been a uh, what uh, what astrological uh, symbol would we have been in five thousand years ago? We would have been in Draco. In Draco, yeah. and indeed, this is a serpent, mm-hmm. and it's it, it uh, it's very interesting because. You know the same thing happens if you uh, if you line up uh, uh, the Sphinx to Leo. Uh, the Sphinx is it lines up to Leo, at, and it, 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 and Leo would have set behind the Sphinx at the time that Leo was the ascendant uh, constellation. And you know the odd thing is that in the in the Old Testament of the Bible. The animal most often mentioned is the bull, and of course, it was in the time of Taurus that the Old Testament was written. Then the New Testament comes along, and suddenly it's the fisher of men. Right. And the New Testament was written in the age we're in, in Pisces. Exactly. Yeah. It suggests, does it not, that we have just now covered fifteen or ten thousand years from the Sphinx to the Gospels via the serpent mound and the Bible, that somebody somewhere has a plan, and maybe they're real big, and maybe you're on to one of their biggest secrets. Uh, what can you tell us more about this mysterious mound? Open it up for us. Let's get the knowledge out. Okay. Okay. We've established that, as many people have, have, have told me, that the serpent seems to be an embodiment of all light, all celestial light, all terrestrial light. Everything seems to be pouring into it from the stars, the sun, and the moon. It seems to be the the adorable child of all the cosmos. And as it sits on the earth, it seems to bring forth all the earth energies and attract the fire of the sky in the form of lightning. Well, that was quite enough for me until I began to experiment with sacred geometry, okay? Now, I'm sure there's people out there in your listening audience who are far more adept at sacred geometry than I am, but 
I've plunged myself into it for well over 15 years now. And we have made some very interesting discoveries regarding the Serpent Mound as a template. Now, my friend, Bill Romain, who made the first now, map of the Serpent Mound. When you say template, exactly what do you mean? What are you doing when you use it as a template? Okay, let's say that uh, you're a teacher of geometry and you have discovered a French curve. A lot of people are, I'm sure you're familiar with what a French curve is. It's used in, in, um, in architecture. It's usually a, a, pla- a clear piece of plastic that has a specific uh, curvature to it that may be to the phi series or, or some ratio of, of the pi. And it has an in, innate beauty to it that is attracted to the eye. And a, a person would use a, um, a, a template like this or a template in the form of a star or a circle or a square in order to demonstrate various geometric axioms. Um, A template is something that you use to show what you are thinking. In, In our case, the serpent mound is a template that seems to have a common denominator with the five most important plane geometries, in other words, two-dimensional geometries, that preceded the introduction of three-dimensional geometries by Pythagoras and later the Platonic solids. Now, by projecting our serpent image over the circle, the cube, that's where we get into three dimensions, um, the hexagon, the vesica Pisces, and the sacred cut, where, and, and not to mention, of course, the Pythagorean theorem, which I'd like to get into in depth. In a minute, yeah. yeah. Um, we're able to show that the serpent seems to have bridged all geometrical knowledge as well. Uh, Amazing. <laughs> I mean, they, they, whoever created this was, this was done by geniuses. We're going to get back into into that, just to, just who they really were in just a minute. Sweetly Streber, it's Dreamland. We're talking to Ross Hamilton. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Streber. It's Dreamland, the mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. Ross Hamilton's website, greatserpentmound.org. Don't miss it. Get into this thing. This is this is a key of some kind, and we're gonna, we're going to turn the key and open this door here and see what's what's going on. Let me let me take a little bit of a different tack at this moment. Uh, at the there is a rather famous image on a uh, bas relief on a temple wall dendera in egypt and it, it it almost looks as if a group of workers are involved in some way with what could be large glass tubes and it, they seem to have some kind of electrical connection even connected to them it's uh, hard to know but in the tubes in each tube is a serpent and there is an indication in the hieroglyphics surrounding this that these represent the soul that these these are souls and i was always curious about whether or not there could be such a thing as a technology of the soul and that maybe these people had actually captured souls somehow uh and i want to ask you if what the relationship because the serpent is one of the most general mythological images in all the world. Uh, the serpent is in the Garden of Eden, but the serpent is a lot of other places. And if you go to China, then the dragon becomes such a centrally important figure, and not a figure of danger but anymore, but a figure of luck and joy and happiness. Uh, fierce, but wonderful. The So where does the serpent mound come uh, in uh, down in relation to all of this myth? Well, Willie, that that's probably the most poignant question you could ask because my background is in is in spiritual science. I was initiated by a perfect master, a sat guru, a sant, a master saint, 
who was able to demonstrate to us how to lift up out of the body, how to literally withdraw behind the eyes and, and converge into a small ball of energy, which we call the soul. And he gave us each a demonstration of how to rise above body consciousness. And this is not astral projection. When we learn to do that, we, we have, it's like coming out of a sweat box. You sort of open up into the heavenly ethers, and you, you, you witness the heavenly scene where you go or where you came from before you embodied. And then the master very carefully and lovingly puts you back in the body and, and, and says, well, you know, you know the truth now, so now you have to work toward that. Well, working toward that, we have to read a lot that the masters have written and the saints. And one of the things you come across is, is the poignant imagery of the serpent and why the serpent is not actually an animal, but it actually represents the Logos, the Word. I was just going to say that we're, it sounds like we're getting to the Word. <laughs> One of the most remarkable parts of the book, by the way, the Word. The Word. Now, every religion that's been conceived, from the Buddhist to the Jain to the Sikh, the Sikh to, the, uh, to the Muslim, uh, the Christian, the Jews... Um, uh, the Hindu, every 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 religion that's that's been conceived was conceived by a master who was an initiate of the sound principle. Um, it's from communion with the sound principle that we become one with that which is the creator of all things and the sustainer of all matter. And I know this sounds abstruse to some people and, and pretty deep, but it's actually relatively simple when you have the demonstration given to you. This image of the serpent represents the tool by which the unseen one, the spirit of the one God, made things. It's the movement across the, the waters of the ether. And the Egyptians knew this, and they, they spoke of it. And they called this serpent Nebel. Habaku, I believe. And this is but one name for something that really has no name. And as it comes down to us, we call it Nam, um, Om, Logos, Word, uh, the Water of Life, Abihayat in the Muslim. Uh, I could go on. Uh, there are many names for it. Bani, Shabd. But it, it represents that which came into manifestation out of pure love. And so you you will notice that the serpent is featured upon, and I think some of your people out there will know this this particular uh, figure quite well, what we, what's called the flower of life. It, it's, a, uh, it's a hexagonal figure that when you reduce it has 37 internal points, has 24 external points, and and anybody who has my book could turn to page 30 and, and see a picture of the serpent on this hexagon. And if you think it's amazing that it fits right into the constellation Draco, it's more amazing that it fits precisely into the asterisk of this little. And, of course, there's measurement associated with it, which gets back to the, to the Egyptian and the Celtic measurements. But this particular geometry is very fetching because... It's described in the book of Re the Christian book of Revelation as the throne of God having 24 elders seated about it, <clears throat> and then it describes what those elders do, and the so many eyes fill the throne. And what's unique about this is when you multiply the internal number of the hexagon by the external number, 37 by 24, you get the number 888 which in the Greek is the way they broke down the number of Jesus. Okay, So wow. in the mystical Christianity, Jesus, which is spelled in the Greek I-H-S-O-U-S, -S Iota, Eta, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma, adds up, those numbers, those letters add up to 888. So this name of Jesus was a, a name that was created by the Father or the Unseen One to have a specific meaning in association with this throne, which is not less than the atom itself, with its internal constituents and its external appearance. 
And this is how the ancients believed that this atom was one and the same with the soul. So wow. This is how they understood themselves. And they had to become like little children because the soul is very small. It sits behind the eyes in the forehead. <laughs> There's a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Now, as we go into the next part of the geometries, you'll notice that when you create the vesica Pisces, which is the term that means fish bladder, in other words, the swim bladder that keeps a fish balanced, right. you'll notice that the serpent fits precisely into the vesica, not changing its position on the hexagon at all. And that the, the, the perimeter measure in feet of either of these circles is the number of Jesus Christ. Now, this is 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, okay? But these numbers were very much in use for a very long time before the Christian era, even before the Jews, where these numbers were very popular. Then we could get into the Pythagorean theorem part. The serpent is then taken off as a template. It's used um, to fulfill the understanding of the mystery of Pythagoras. Now, Pythagoras lived about 2,500 years ago. Right. He was a great collector. He loved to walk around the known world, and he went everywhere, and this is all recounted in my book. And he collected information from the various priest crafts and holy men and wise people and seers and sages and teachers and common people. And he brought it all back to Greece. And on his travels, and this is one of the stipulations of my book, when he was traveling, I believe that somehow he came across this already ancient template of the serpent. And he named himself Pythagoras. After that, mm -hmm. although although the story of his life says the Delphinian Oracle, yes, named him. Yeah, so we'll we'll go with that. Now the Python was the serpent that Apollo slew. Okay, and this gets back to the slaying of the serpent by nailing its heart, and that's when we when we begin to create those geometries and match them up with the stars, and that begins its slaying. Or in other words, it's becoming a common knowledge. And as we'll see later on in the book, the knowledge of the tree of life itself, the Kabbalistic tree itself, is inherent with this image of the serpent mound. They are one and the same. They're like two peas in a pot. So, Whitley, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of very concentrated information, and, and the serpent seems to be at the center of all this knowledge. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, let's talk a bit about uh, the the Draconis associated with the wars in heaven, most specifically the war with the Titans, and see where that may lead us. This is Whitley Streber. It's Streamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We are back with Ross Hamilton, The Mystery of the Serpent Mound, in search of the alphabet of the gods. We're beginning to learn, I think, that it's possible to read some extraordinary and great secrets hidden uh, in the code of the Serpent Mound. Uh, and Ross, just before we left, though, uh, th there are many, many legends about uh the, about Draco and and uh, the, like for example, there's a Greek legend that the uh, Draco was killed by, I believe, Cadmus, the brother of Europa. And there's another one. Uh, uh, there are many Greek legends about about the dragon, and and there uh, is another one about the dragon being killed in the war of the war with the giants with the titans and you know i relate this back to the to the very some of the very ancient vedas suggesting that there was once a great war in heaven and that somehow or another uh we have 
kind of remnants of this scattered through uh, memories of this scattered through all of our mythology. Does this ring any kind of a bell here at all? Am I going in a direction that's of interest to you? Well, that's a good question. It, I don't specifically deal with with the uh, the effects of of the uh, of the cosmos at that period because when a lot of those myths were written, the serpent was already over twenty five hundred years old. So, yeah. in order to to um, include, you know, the understanding when when they slew Draco, it means that they were going out of that age; they were moving into the next age. Right. So, so it, they had already begun to lose that knowledge, except for one institution, and that institution was the Oracle of Delphi. They preserved the knowledge of the Python, which was Draco, and like we said in the last segment, um, that name, Python, was fitted into Pythagoras. Right. And when you add up the numbers in the name Pythagoras, the the, uh, the pi, the upsilon, the theta, the alpha, the gamma, the omicron, the rho, and the alpha and the sigma, and you do not ascribe the, the number 200 to the final sigma, but two to end the name, Pythagoras adds up to 666. Okay, so... Meaning, of course, that it is the the, uh, n- the name of forbidden knowledge. It is the fruit of the tree of knowledge that we were forbidden to eat. Very, very good. Now, Pythagoras knew everything that Adam and Eve spilled. <laughs> the gift of the serpent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The serpent spilled spoke to Adam and Eve, and all knowledge was revealed. Now, I don't want to scare some of our Christian people out there, because they're going to say, this is bad stuff. But, in fact, all knowledge, indeed, is contained in the serpent, as long as you have the... the Which, again, is why it's a serpent. Mm -hmm. Because it it contains the same knowledge that was there. What we are actually looking at is is the... actual image of the bearer of the knowledge of Eden. Yes, and and when you see how it fits into the tree of life and how it's swallowing the fruit of the tree of life in its mouth, (laughs) you'll, you'll, you'll come to understand that this is no ordinary work of art. This was a divinely conceived thing, and it seems to have acquired more of its power through the ages, even though it is somehow... When you say divinely conceived, there's a lot that you haven't said. I mean, this your book is... We're just sort of touching the surfaces of it. Uh, what Define your term. Define divine? No, defi- no I'm not asking you to do that. <laughs> why, why do you call it defi- divinely conceived? Well, it's divinely conceived because it, it is not conceived in the mind of any mortal man or woman. It's something that was conceived by an individual or, I, I would say, a spirit of inspiration that was not inhibited by the problems of the flesh. Because it has an overview of all knowledge from the astronomical all the way into the alchemical, it actually gives the formula for producing the philosophical stone. It does. Because it does that, this is not something that some genius like an Einstein sat down and just figured out and then reduced down to a simple form of a serpent and said, here, solve the mystery. I have the key. No, this was done by someone that was above. This was done by something that was above, and it was transmitted to men. And they created it by instruction. I wonder how do you think it was transmitted? Through the heart, through the inspiration, through the soul, and through the mind. Are we talking about uh, an evil presence that that? planted this seed here, or is this something good? When we see that the entire New Testament in the original Greek was penned using the body parts of our great serpent, and that 
Well, what do you mean by that? The body parts. Well, Apollo slew the serpent. And after he slew the serpent, he took all the parts that he had cut up and he threw them down the well shaft beneath the oracle. That lady who sat on the tripod on top of that shaft was then able to transmit the knowledge that was desired by those who came and asked. Previous to that, the serpent lived in the womb of Gaia, in the womb of the earth, and was giving forth information only only to those who were considered worthy. He would eat men for less than walking too hard near him. Mm. But Apollo came and slew it, and he chopped his body up, and then he used that oracular response, that logos, in his oracle to create speech. And so these various body parts went to form the original Greek alphabet, which was the first alphabet, contrary to popular belief that it was the Hebraic alphabet was the first. No, the Greeks invented the first symbol number corresponding, and when you compare the parts of the serpent with the Greek letters, and this is done in detail in the back of the book. Right, and it's really fascinating. You'll see that this is not an evil thing. This is a divinely conceived thing, which is by its nature inherently good. Now, why do you say by its nature inherently good? Well, its nature is that of an inspired genius that is the spirit. I would say the spirit of the Father. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking with Ross Hamilton. The myth, his book, the mystery of the great, of the excuse me, the mystery of the serpent mound. And we became, we came very close to something kind of unexpectedly at the end of the last segment. Uh, we came close to seeing or f- sensing the presence of the of the mind of God among us. Could you expand on that a little bit, Ross? Well, I'd like to expand on the mind of God. But <laughs> no, on what you said. Well, the only thing I can say is that I put this book together. It took over 11 years to put it together. This is the third edition of it, and each time I put it out, I understood it a little bit better. I was under a lot of pressure from friends and my publisher to get this out the last time, and so because of that, I put an extra amount of effort to it. And basically what I'm trying to say, Whitley, is that I understand this better than I ever have, but I still cannot fully comprehend the meaning and message of the Serpent Mound, except for one thing, and that is that the serpent is placed in a specific point on the landscape of eastern North America. That specific point seems to be the heart of a truly gigantic figure, a figure that is inconceivable in its size, but When you look at a map of the United States, you can begin to see it if you have a little imagination. Its head is the state of Michigan. And where the Serpent Mound is today is the heart of this grand man, the son of God, or as some people like to think, the phoenix. Now, some say that the earth has layers and dimensions to it. There are higher dimensions, higher octaves on our planet that many people here and most people here don't have access to. And that in those higher spheres, this figure on the landscape, along with other figures across the globe, is far more apparent than here in this in our world. But that according to Indian legend, according to native legend, and according to many belief systems, including some of our religious traditions from around the world, There will be a great revelation sometime in the future that will affect all flesh, all people. 
and that this will be a witnessing of a conflagration in the sky that will subsequently fall into the earth, almost as though it were a spirit that were coming to rest in a resting body that is in the earth. A beautiful event will occur. I think Handel and his Messiah made it very clear with his music that uh, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. And, and basically, the great serpent seems to be, if you're familiar with the mythology, the worm of the phoenix. Right. Now, the entire Ohio Valley, if my sources are correct, has more sky-to-earth lightning discharges than anywhere else in the world. Now, it doesn't have more lightning than Florida, for example. But it has more sky-to-earth discharges than anywhere else in the world. Hmm. And also the most unusual and exquisitely extraordinary earthwork structures were found in the Ohio Valley. And also, as our researchers have confirmed, there was a race of giants that lived here. And they were magnificent people. They stood... Which gets back to the wars with the Titans, in my mind. It does. There is a relationship, but it was but worldwide. Tell, but tell us more about these giants. This is a fascinating part of the story. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, the Serpent Mound and some of the other extraordinary earthworks could have been conceived and constructed by men and women of gigantic stature. These people, and we have another book coming out soon, it'll be called A Tradition of Giants. These people um, are reputed by Indian legend to have created miracles and performed uh, things <laughs> that they, the, the Indians, could no longer conceive of or could no longer understand because of their antiquity. And that they were indefatigable. They were tireless. And that their lineage stretched back to a time, according to the legends of the Cherokee, that included the introduction of the first man and woman. In other words, there is a great deal of evidence that if our great serpent is indigenous and is of the antiquity that we claim, that this could have been Eden here. And I, and I know that a lot of people are going to disagree. Oh, it had to be in the, in the Middle East, but... But when the glaciers melted a long time ago and when the Atlantic Basin filled up and people had to move out of the Atlantic and Pacific Basins and Atlantis sank and so forth, they took their knowledge to various colonies, Egypt being a colony, Greece being a colony, other places in Africa and in South America and in North America. But these continents never sank there was already a well-developed spiritual culture in North America a long time ago. And there was an event, a heated event, that seems to have melted some of the glacial structure, at least in the area of the Great Lakes in Michigan, exposing the head of this figure, which I describe in the book, so that there may have been a lot of trade and commerce going on even before the last part of the glacial melt 14,000 years ago. Now, this is a little speculation on my part, and um, I'm going to have to do more research. But the way it's shaping up, there is a line that goes from Sault Ste. Marie through Lansing, through Cincinnati, through Frankfurt, through a very special place in Tennessee, which we can't describe at this time with any mm -hmm. diligence, but then through Atlanta, and then through Tallahassee. If you take a ruler and put it across the map of the United States, those cities all are on a perfectly straight line, and that line is true north. Interesting. Yeah, there's a figure there. There's something. There's an, something there's a is one, there. Yeah, yeah. Relates a lot in some ways to the work of William Henry, who's been working on the hidden meanings of some of those some some of uh, parts of that part of the Americas for some time. We are getting closer to the end of our time together with what an interview that almost I almost have missing time. I feel like we just started talking because there is so much here. And you spoke a little bit earlier about 
a life on a higher plane and how most of us are not there. But one of the routes to that level of reality is through things like this, contemplating a mystery like this. Here is Ross Hamilton bringing to us a living mystery, vividly living mystery that we can take into ourselves as what it is, as a mystery. And magically, it can make our souls lighter because we learn to see more. Ross, uh, as we conclude, do you have a kind of a final message from uh, a man who has become a sort of master of the serpent mound? <laughs> Dare I call you that, a modern one? Well, that, that's true flattery, and I hope that... It's not flattery. Learned. Flattery is never true. It's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, truly, that's a compliment, and, and I aspire to, to be that and everything more. If I had to, to say anything to the folks out there who, who have been kind enough to listen to all this, I would say visit the Serpent Mound and and uh, and meet other people who right. have uh, visited there. And uh, if you can afford it, pick up the book. You can get it at any decent bookstore. And, and on uh, unknowncountry.com on our website. Yep, yep. For a decent price, I might add. <laughs> and look through it. And if you can't read the whole thing, just look at the pictures, and eventually you might be able to read it. Oh nonsense! You'll be able to read it easily. This has got to be the most one of the most educated uh, audiences in this area in the world. I mean, they'll, don't even think twice about it, folks. You'll be able to read. The, you'll read every word of it easily. Thank you. Yeah, well, sure. <laughs> and and uh, pictures, many of them are literally worth a thousand words. They're awesome because they take you, gosh, to places where where you have to say yes, he's right. There was a there was great mastery behind the creation of this. Some, A great mind has moved here in the earth and made this. Ross Hamilton, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Whitley. It's Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award-winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and writer who investigates new and unusual aspects of science, medicine, and the environment. Today, she has a special report for us on findings on the Mars lander photographs. Here she is from Philadelphia, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. As the new year of 2004 gets underway, the Bush administration announced this week that the president will soon propose a plan to send a manned American mission to Mars and to the moon. In addition to proposing the first trip back to the moon since ni December 1972, President Bush says that he wants to build a permanent space station there. Some scientists speculate that the moon could be used as the preparation and launching pad for a manned Mars mission. Mars has already been dominating the news before this White House announcement. This past Saturday, January 3rd, 2004, NASA scientists cheered in their Pasadena Jet Propulsion Lab control room as a robot named Spirit came down inside the Martian crater Gusev near the red planet's equator. Spirit is the fourth American machine to successfully land on Mars since the first Viking mission of 1976. Spirit was dropped to the Martian surface by its orbiter and was protected in its fall by many airbags. When Spirit hit the dusty surface inside the crater, it bounced several times before coming to a stop. Then on January 8th, when NASA engineers tried to move the six-wheeled robot out of its lander to explore the ground and rocks around it, one of the airbags blocked its path. The goal is to get the Spirit robotic geologist rolling on the crater surface by Wednesday, January 12th, but this airbag problem might delay that exploration by a few more days. And a second robot named Opportunity is expected to land on the opposite side of Mars on January 24th at roughly noon Eastern time. That will give scientists and engineers a second shot at looking at mineralogy on the other side of Mars. 
spirit and opportunity were made to be Earth's first roving robotic geologists on Mars, capable of drilling into the surfaces of rocks to find out what they are made of. Scientists also hope that these robots will be able to find evidence of maybe lake water or running water from Mars' ancient past. No one today doubts that there is ice water and carbon dioxide ice in the very cold northern high latitudes of the Red Planet. But where did all the water go that left big channels and canyons? The first images from the Spirit Lander showed the iron red surface covered by rocks and a pink sky, just as Viking had done back in 1976. But these new images from Spirit are the clearest ever transmitted back to Earth. In fact, one of the cameras on Spirit, called a pan cam, has the sharpness of the human eye. The images were sent back to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena from two satellites that we currently have orbiting Mars and which received data from the Spirit robotic lander. One of the first photographs surprised planetary geologists. It shows strange tracks near the Spirit, almost as if the soil were folded on itself in layers. Many of the scientists participating in the Spirit and Opportunity Lander research are from Cornell University. This week, I talked with Cornell's Dr. Peter Thomas, Senior Research Associate at the Center for Radio Physics and Space Research in Ithaca, New York. He is an expert on Martian surface features, and I asked him about the unusual appearance of these strange landing tracks. I mean, they're unusual in the sense that we haven't seen them before from uh, at least exactly like that from the previous landers. But the previous landers, including all the way back to Viking, have shown that they're uh, among the things that are on the Martian surface mixed in are not just these things that, you know, might be sort of dark minerals and, and clays or things like that, is, but also things you consider salt like sulfur. And very small amounts, but still there. And so there is some variety of materials which might, with very small particles, give it some cohesion. I mean, we, we know this from the way dust particles behave when they're actually when they're when they're dry. Uh, just very small things can in fact give them cohesion, and so they may behave in, in interesting ways, especially if you push down on them a little bit, uh, a soft deposit with an airbag and then let go of it. When I first saw it, it did. It did really look a little bit like sort of, you know, you slide something on on the surface where there's something a little thin layer that's loose. Um, and, uh, these are some of the things I'd love to see in stereo to really sort of get a feel for what the three-dimensional form of this disturbed material is. Um, Do you think there's any chance that it's water or uh, an oily substance or something that is right there under that surface dust? Well, it's, it's probably more like, um, again, little bits of sulfur or other salts uh, that can, can bind these very small particles with. Uh, small, but still significant in, in this context, uh, electrostatic forces between the, between the, uh, the dust particles. I don't think you really need much in the way of water vapor or ice uh, in order to do that uh, do that bonding. But certainly the soil, you know, as one of the soil components around the area, that will get looked at. But uh, the rover probably isn't going to actually exit the, uh, the lander for uh, several more days. And then will it be independent enough to uh, go out and, and say, drill down uh, into this area that is compacted? Um, the the drilling, I mean, it will rove and it is independent. You know, once it moves off, it is free of the lander. Um, it does have a thing called a rock abrasion tool on it, which is designed to basically remove rinds on rocks such that you can then look at it with microscopic imagers um, and determine what the composition below anything is. Now, this looks like fairly loose material, so using the rock abrasion tool, this would probably just scatter the uh, scatter the, the, the particles. And so the examination of this probably will not involve um, uh, the rock abrasion tool, but you can certainly get uh, an idea of what minerals and elements are in it. And one of the other things is just simply 
ability to drive a uh, rover wheel over it to just see what the mechanical response to a uh, pressure is. You know what the pressure at the bottom of a rover wheel is. If you just drove a rover wheel over part of this stuff and see how far it goes in, you can get a good idea of the mechanical properties. And that really sort of tells you something about the strength of the material, which in combination with its chemical composition can then, and the, even using microscopic imagery, may tell you a lot about, uh, you know, is this typical wind deposited dust, or has it had some sort of unusual erosional history, or is it a particular composition that happens to clump more nicely than other dust on Mars? Any possibility that this could be CO2 ice in those compressed tracks? It's probably not because the CO2 ice comes out at much colder temperatures and even the, the water does. Uh, this is a fairly low and low latitude part of Mars, so it's really uh, too warm for that to be CO2 ice associated with it. Is it fair as a reporter to say we definitely know that there's some water on Mars? Uh, oh, yeah, there's certainly some water on Mars. It's, uh, may not be very much, and it may be in very unglamorous uh, situations of being little bits of ice in the soil at high latitudes, but uh, that's what the gamma ray instrument says. And could spirit or opportunity uh, have landed in that northern latitude? Just no, it, it's harder in the, it, just because of the temperatures and the uh, amount of sunlight uh, to work landers at the high latitudes. Uh, there will be another lander heading to moderate high latitudes in a few years, but uh, the Mars Polar Lander a few years ago, which uh, unsuccessfully tried to land at uh, high latitudes, you know, would have, you know, was specifically among its experiments trying to sort of physically see if there's any water ice near the surface there. It's just a little bit more difficult because of the shorter sunlight seasons and the much colder temperatures to, uh, to put landers at high latitudes. And how deep could Spirit drill? Uh, its drill is really only designed to go very short distance into hard rock. It's not like, you know, a really drill going down any depth at all. It's just really to get the, a few millimeters of covering off of rocks. So we don't have yet the ability to drill straight down like looking for water on the earth somehow. Right. It's, it's one, hard to do, and uh, it's also not really expected to be particularly useful. But can the orbiters that you uh, are so uh, familiar with, can they, using radar uh, and other uh, systems, can they detect water at any specific depth now on Mars? Well, they, uh, they may be able to give you some indication of that. The, uh, the, the Mars Express, which the Europeans just put into orbit, um, uh, has a radar unit on it, which will give you some information on sort of layering a depth. Uh, it might give some indication of whether there's the possibility of some um, water in the pores of the, of the rock and soil, um, but that would be sort of a big, an average number. Another mystery in Mars surface photographs are all the rocks. If wind and dust have been blowing for centuries, why do they look so fresh and even angular? Why aren't they all worn down to smooth surfaces beneath the red dust of Mars? We'll hear more about those questions after this break. This is Linda Moulton Howe from EarthFiles.com reporting for Dreamland Online. Cornell's Dr. Peter Thomas is particularly interested in the role that wind and dust play on Mars. I ask him why, if wind has sandblasted the surface for millennia, why are there so many rocks of various sizes and shapes, many fresh and angular in these recent Martian photographs and photographs we've had from the past? Well, it's been subject to meteorite impacts for a long time, and that's just really like hitting with a hammer. So you break things up where there's solid rock, uh, even sometimes when there's not solid rock, the impacts can uh, compact it and make it into fairly solid rocks. So that's one of the methods. Uh, that is most likely for the sort of scattering of rocks. And that would mean then that the surface of Mars was largely extraterrestrial in terms of meteorites coming in? That those rock, the rocky surfaces would not well, be indigenous? Well, the rocks themselves would not be the meteorites. They would be the fragments of the local rock that have been broken up by being hit by the hit by the meteorites. Only a very small fraction of the material would be would be meteorites. It would be the fragmented debris that happens when you hit something with a high-speed meteorite. Now, there are other ways, of course, of breaking, like breaking the rocks up, but that's one of the ones which sort of tends to like, scatter some of the stuff. Now, of course, all of these rocks here might not have been in place that way. They may have been rocks carried there by water and gradually eroded into sharper uh, 
Leopard and Fox carried only a short distance by water and hence not rabid very much, and maybe sharpened up more by the wind later. And that's one of the reasons you want to go over and really kind of drill into the rock, see exactly what what's on the inside, whether the inside is the same as the outside, and uh, to see what all the local layering is, and whether the rock was carried there by water or whether it evidently was dropped there as part of material thrown out of a nearby impact crater. If we've got the biggest uh, volcano in the biggest canyon in the uh, solar system in Mars, uh, why we haven't sent a rover near either one of those, especially that volcano? Uh, basically, because of the topography, it's, um, uh, it's, if you remember the landing scheme for this using uh, the bouncing, uh, bouncing scheme, and you put it on a long slope, such as on Olympus Mons, then you have no clue as to where the thing will wind up or how many hours later it will wind up. And that's sort of the same thing with the, uh, with the canyon. Is, um, <clears throat> you can target these things to an accuracy of maybe a few tens of miles horizontally. Uh, you may actually do better than that, but you really don't believe beforehand that you're going to get within you know, a few miles of where you're targeting. And so if you have rough topography like that, then you really don't know the kind of things you're going to land on or will it be safe. And certainly a bouncing system is not one that you want to put down on something with very long slopes. You may continue to roll uh, for a very long time. And after this, with opportunity and spirit, uh, each with about a three-month uh, research mission as these uh, robotic geologists, um, what is the next significant sort of close-up look at surface and all of that? Uh, after these missions, there are there is a, a smarter lander uh, designed for a few years from now. The ultimate goal of the lander is that's uh, many years down the road, just this very complicated operation to do right and safely. Uh, there are continuing orbital missions to survey the planet in various ways and look at the, the climate. Uh, we've had Mars Global Surveyor going for the last six years, and Mars Odyssey continuing to orbit. And subsequent orbiters, one of which to be launched in 2005, will sort of continue to give us uh, basically a sort of continuous look at uh, Mars weather and climate over several years so we can start to get a real sort of handle on, on how that operates over many years. Also on Mars is the European Space Agency's Beagle 2 lander. Scientists are very disappointed that the Beagle 2 released from the Mars Express orbiter on Christmas Day to land on the red planet surface has still not sent back any signals. Mars Express is the first European mission to another planet, and ESA officials remain hopeful that there still might be communication with Beagle 2, which was tasked with collecting soil and rock samples for analysis, similar to what is happening with Spirit and Opportunity, but all scientists need more data from many different parts of Mars and this was hoped that by 2004, January, that there would be uh, more than uh, uh, spirit uh, and opportunity that the Beagle would also be re- sending back data uh, to the Earth. But I asked Dr. Thomas if there was any more news about the fate of Britain's Beagle 2 lander. And any more news on Beagle 2? Uh, I haven't heard any. Uh, any speculation about what could have happened? Well, it's a difficult thing to do, and that was uh, a mission that uh, didn't have a lot of redundant parts on it, so um, uh, so it's hard to tell. Do you think that the antenna itself could have landed and broken the antenna? Um, I... You know, it's that no, it's just all be speculation. I mean, you really don't know what uh, what might have uh, what might have happened. So it's uh, it's difficult. Uh, I don't know much of the details about the actual operation of the Beagle. You know, uh, it would be nice if it uh, showed up, um, but uh, we don't know at the moment. And would the Mars observers have 
lenses uh, that they would be able to look close up in areas where they think it might be trying to find it? Uh, that would be really very difficult because the uh, the area that you can cover at the high resolution from those would be very small compared to the area that it possibly landed in. Or it's, you may, you know, it may be a couple hundred kilometers on the side that you'd be looking for, and it would, if you dedicated all the resources of the orbiters to that, it would take a long time with with actually not any really useful result because you would just barely be able to detect that something that maybe was there. Its, its size is so small that even detecting it would be marginal and detecting it in a useful way is even more unlikely because it really wouldn't tell you, it probably wouldn't tell you anything about why it was not communicating. President Bush's call for a manned flight to Mars might change NASA's current plans to send a mission to Mars that could physically bring back to Earth some of the soil and rock samples beyond what the current spirit and opportunity are able to do. Dr. Thomas says that it is a complicated mission where you have to design a system that can place a lander where you want it to go, return it to a vehicle that can then launch itself from the surface of Mars, and return to Earth where it can somehow be successfully captured and the rocks and the soil gotten to labs. NASA scientists and engineers are now working on such a mission for a launch, they hope, within the next 10 years. To keep track of all of the NASA Mars images from these and other future missions, go to www.jplnasa.gov. And to keep up with the latest Mars, Moon, and other news headlines from our solar system and the Earth mysteries around us, please visit my website, www.earthfiles.com. Today's report with images from Spirit are at the top of the headlines page. Just click to view them. This is Linda Moulton Howe from earthfiles.com reporting for Dreamland Online. And this is Whitley Strieber. Thank you very much, Linda. Linda Moulton Howe's website, earthfiles.com. Do not miss it. Next week on Dreamland, William Henry is back. The second part of The Illuminator presented without commercial interruption. We're very excited about this. The Illuminator, William Henry, his most incredible book. By an immense impact from an asteroid that broke up uh, millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. This piece of property is uh, understandably unique because the rock is shattered more than, I think, two kilometers below the surface, and it creates a um, a constant trapping and changing of the magnetic field so that there's a lot of magnetic and gravitational anomalies throughout the crypto-explosion feature but these anomalies are, are, are really evident at the surface mound. Now, it, it, why would it be that in the distant past, how, how can you detect these anomalies now? Well, a sensitive person can detect them if, one, if he or she spends enough time there. I, how? I talked to the, how well, for example, I talked to the previous park manager. He's an older man, and uh, he was... Uh, uh, pretty much a professional policeman most of his life. But uh, he he was uh, able to see earth light. He was able to detect uh, specific energy fields, especially along the side of the cliffs that the Serpent Mound rests near. And other people that I've talked to have seen unusual creatures. Uh, I, I think a, a, almost a hot pink frog was, was seen there at one time, and Plants that don't seem to grow anywhere else in the state seem to grow around that area. And there's a lot of unusual caves and other enigmatic subterranean structures going on. There's an unusual bat population. Um, by the way, Earthlight, an Earthlight uh, is discussed by Paul Deveron in some of his books. Yes. Um, Earthlights are a strange phenomenon that we believe now are associated with, with a concentration of magnetic force that rises up and becomes a bet of the gods. And I am, as you know, absolutely 
fascinated with the mysteries of the past. I know you are too. And because, for a simple reason, unless we understand what our past really was, we can never find out and understand who we really are. And we all know that. We all know that the advance of the human spirit into higher consciousness depends upon and a clear understanding of the human past. So I think that Ross has done something rather amazing with this book, The Mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. And let me quote an extraordinary book. Ross Hamilton's discoveries and revelations in Mystery of the Serpent Mound kick open the door to an amazing reevaluation of what we call the new world. Jeff Rentz said that, and I would heartily concur. This is one book that I read with such fascination that I almost had finished it by the time I sat down to read it. So welcome to the show, Ross. Uh, I'm delighted to have you. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. Oh, great, Willie. It's great to be on your show. Well, good. Uh, at first, let's begin by getting an explanation. What is the Great Serpent Mound and where is it? Well, <clears throat> Great Serpent Mound is an earthwork which, if it were not in the form of a serpent, but just stretched out, would be a quarter of a mile long. Mm -hmm. It's located in southern Ohio, actually pretty close to the Ohio River, not far at all. I would say within about six miles as the crow flies. It was constructed on a very high piece of land that's on the edge of what we call a crypto explosion feature, which is a piece of property, mostly stone, with earth that's gathered on top of it over the millennia. That's about five kilometers across. And we're pretty sure now that it was created by almost electrical, and then it interacts sometimes with the gases of the atmosphere to produce strange effects, which include the ability to, to shape its mass to form what a person wants to see. So if a person believes in ghosts, sometimes the earth lights will, will take the form, these wisps will take the form of ghostly apparitions. So they, they seem to be manipulable through uh, the imagination or the, or the will of someone who is, really believes. So it, this whole feature uh, that the Serpent Mound uh, rests on is, very, is relatively high, and the energies from the crypto explosion feature seem to gradually find their way through the dolomite, which is mostly limestone, that uh, is beneath the, uh, the earthwork, and, and, and converge into the earthwork structure itself, which, which was made to be a little bit on the top, or mostly on the top of that whole area. So, so as the energies rise up, they, they seem to find some sort of consummation and animation with the serpent. And if you go there really early in the morning or in the winter, when nobody's been walking around sort of soaking up the energy, you can feel it. it the, the area is very charged. It's, uh, I won't say it's electrical, but it can be that. Um, I remember uh, two people telling me that they witnessed lightning strikes right near that area. And, of course, Native American legend speaks about these types of effigies being made, this being the, the great one, that were specifically created to attract lightning because they were able to gather together the earth spirit, which is kind of like a very positive force. And when you get enough of that energy collected, uh, it, it will attract lightning. So they believe that the Thunderbird came and opened his eyes and lightning flashed out, and he was always in the hunt for the serpent. So <laughs> you can see where this mythology may have evolved from. Yeah, well, in part, but as we get into the area, and I was just interested to, if you could tell us a little bit more about the caves. Well, the caves in the area, nobody really knows, but when we went up for the, uh, I guess it was in November, for the Harmonic Concordance, uh, we all gathered at the mound, and there was there was quite a few people there. And one of the women who lives on the property adjacent to the mound, Delcy, she mentioned that uh, just a week before, when she was out um, on the road, her house is a very rural area. Uh, it was it it was just beginning to rain a little bit, and it was a it was a thunder a thunderstorm, and the lightning came, and it went 
into the ground, and there was no thunder sound for a couple of seconds, and it, and it hit so close, all of a sudden she hears the thunder under her feet. <laughs> now, this woman is not given over to telling tales, and, and her mother experienced the same thing. The, the thunder came from underground, but, but the lightning came from the sky. So this got back to the harmonic convergence, which was back in the late 80s. There's another huge gathering of people there. And at that time, we had a, a group of people who, some of them were very sensitive, some of them were known psychics, some of them were dowsers, and they all agreed that there was some sort of a vast and awesome cavern system in that specific area because of all the limestone. Now, we we found a, a number of small caves, and there's a huge collapsed sinkhole right on the Surfer Mound property, but it appears as though there is a very... Um, I mean, a very important cave system under there that no one has been able to figure out how to get into it yet. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd never heard of anything like that, but... You know. No. <laughs> well, this is on that note. Uh, we're going to take a little break. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. To this, it's going to become clear that there's much more here than meets the eye. I, 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 let me put it this way, folks. We are going on a journey like you have never gone on before. You may think that the Great Serpent Mound has is isolated, an isolated North American phenomenon, but we are looking at a statement in the form of a serpent-shaped mound that is of world historical importance and contains what I think must be one of the most compressed and incredibly dense uh, uh, concentrations of knowledge on this planet. This is a mystery. I didn't know it was a mystery until I picked up Ross's book, but it's a mystery and it's exciting. So we're just at the beginning of the mystery and now let's go into another area here, uh, and I have to ask you, just in passing, are you familiar with Mound Road? Mound Road. Mound Road. It's out there. near. It's not far from the Great Serpent Mound. Uh, well... There are a lot of mounds around. There, there are. <laughs> I've never heard uh, the term Mound Road, so you got me on that one. Well, because uh, out on Mound Road, there was a um, an EG&G Rotron facility for a while. And it was an underground facility. And you mentioned strange caves before. <laughs> and I, that Rotron facility may still be there. And I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, absolutely, I'm actually not sure how close it is to the Serpent Mound. It could be quite a distance away. But in any case, there was an interest in, these, in the makers of underground facilities. They have a big underground facility in Woodstock, New York, that connects to the... Uh, to the uh, Iron Mountain facility that's south of Woodstock and Rosendale. So Rotron is in this underground facility game. And they're also out there in the mound 